Let's talk about buying and selling in the city of Tolis. First, I mentioned in another video how the marketplaces of Tolis are a special consideration that a lot of DMs and GMs might be kind of scared of or have issue with, so I want to deal with that. I also want to tell you about how I run a very wealthy campaign and why that doesn't concern me over much and why I think you should be okay with it as well. And then I want to tell you a little bit about how those markets work, where they are, and what some of the places that you might encounter both as the narrator and as a player when it comes to trying to offload your stuff or buy new stuff. I'm going to start in the middle of the city at the place where most players spend most of their time, and that's Delver's Square. Right around in this loop, we'll start off with the Bull and Bear Armory. This is a location where you can both buy and sell magical armor. You have kind of a, a different option there. GMs, you still have the power to handle whatever is in the shop. For example, there might not necessarily be a plus five set of celestial plate mail, right? You can still control what's in the setting and what's available. And this is something that I've had a lot of fun with because as we release a little bit of news about a whole new cache of stuff was found down in the dungeon, well then these stores are now super busy because stuff has been sold to them and now there's new inventory to buy. But again, you're the narrator, so whether it's armor, magic items, whatever, you really get to control that. One weird consideration is the specific organization called the Dreaming Apothecary, and that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Next, we've got the Ghostly Minstrel. They'll spend most of their time there. Raster's Weapons. This is one that you can deal with a little bit different in terms of Raster, who is actually a Latorian. He will only pay 50% of whatever the DMG value is for that weapon. Again, those percentages and prices are up to you. I've basically almost always followed the DMG guide. I may have made some adjustments based on, you know, this is a little more rare, or I think the setting might have adjusted for this, where, for example, ropes of climbing are more expensive here because so many people want them because of all the Delvers in the Undercity. But again, that's up to you what's available and what those prices are. So if you don't want people buying magic items, you could just, you know, triple the price of all of them. But again, I don't feel like you should do that, and I'll keep talking about that here in a little bit. Come around here to Ebert's Outfitters. This is basically all mundane stuff. You know, the, your ropes, your backpacks, pickaxes, stuff like that. They'll spend a lot more money here as they're at the low levels. And when they get higher, they're mostly going to be going to the other stores. Finally, around the corner here is Myreth's Oddities. That's how I pronounce it anyway. This is where you can buy all manner of strange stuff. Everything from, you know, maybe a, an any tool that magically transforms to any other kind of weird magical oddities, goggles of night or, or something like that. So the oddities part is basically like it's not a weapon, it's not armor, it's not a potion, although maybe sometimes he has some potions. And so this is kind of a way you can throw that in. There's a few guides on the listing for this in the book, if you read through, that gives you an idea of what those inventory are. You can jump down into the Delver Square Undercity Market, so directly beneath Delver Square is the Undercity Market, and then there's places to buy potions, there's retired adventurers in there trying to offload their equipment that they don't need anymore. You can buy scrolls and other stuff like that. You're also able to go up into like the Church of Lothian area. Like you wouldn't buy it at St. Valian's Cathedral because that's like the big, big church, right? But they talk about St. Gustav Chapel that you can buy healing potions there. You can also pay to be healed at that location. And then if you come down, there's some other really cool places. Uh, there is another armorer, which I'm having trouble finding now. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things that you can do on this website, which is pto ptol.us, you can come up here to the filling campaign needs. So you can see there's equipment, services, accommodations, entertainment, information, all the way down the list, right? So the armorer I was looking for was Avery's Armorer. So he's in Midtown. This is cool. The Bull and Bear is kind of the one that everybody goes to. Avery's Armor is a little bit more specialized. The gear, you've got Ebert's Outfitters, you've got Sign of the Shovel, and then this is the Ursans used. These are both in the Undercity Market. So again, you have to go down there. Alchemical stuff, there's technology. So uh, for example, the Smoke Shop, you, this is, you can choose whether or not to use this in your world, which is firearms, right? But that's what the Smoke Shop does. There's clothing where you can buy all kinds of stuff, books. There's a whole list of services. You can pay for healing, training, locksmithing, repairs, money, right? There's just a huge list here. So if you ever want to look through this, feel free. This is free and public. And this is something that players can look at as well 
because it just gives you an idea of where you can find these things. Something else that's kind of cool is the price and quality ratings. This is something that is in the book, so it gives you an idea of this is what the location is. You know, it's a temple, it's a shop, it's a service, a restaurant. And then it tells you what the adventure level is. This is mostly for the DM, obviously. But if it's a high-level adventure, that means there's something super dangerous there. Price ratings, it shows from cheap all the way up to luxury, so you get a good idea of when you're looking at the entry, what it is. And so then you've also got quality from poor all the way up to excellent. And then it gives you those breakdowns here. Something that's kind of cool that we've enjoyed using in the campaign is Monty Cook actually gave us different names for money. So like a platinum piece is a dragon, a gold piece is a throne, etc., etc. And so those are just kind of a, a fun thing that you can throw in there if you want. And then you obviously you don't have to. Again, most of your time is going to be spent running around in Delver Square. That's They're probably going to stay at the Ghostly Minstrel. They're probably going to buy and sell most of their stuff that they find down in the dungeon or on whatever adventure you send them to. But there's also a couple other places around. The filling campaign needs will help you with that. One of the ones that my, my, cust my players usually find themselves at is also called Star Jewelers. Uh, you are able, if I can search over here, if I come over here, Star Jewelers, boom, zooms me right in. And you can see it's down here in the Guildsman District. And Star Jewelers is run by dwarves that actually pay 100% of gem values. So that way your, your players don't have to feel like they're losing money. They can also use gems for big purchases. That's all the stuff where you can really control what they can buy and sell, right? It's, it's what's available, you tell them what's in the store and what's not. And then it's really up to you to set those prices as well. The very weird thing about Tolis, I've never seen this in any other campaign, but my, care, my players have really enjoyed it, is the Dreaming Apothecary. What happens is you have to go into a place, one of those places is uh, Danbury's, which is a tavern basically for wizards, and you get this little token, you put it under a pillow, and that night this person comes to you in your dreams, and you can basically order any magic item you can imagine. The book gives you a whole lot of details about how this works. And so, again, if this is something that you just hate as a DM, you're like, no, I only want them to be able to find magic items. They can't buy them. That's your right. Again, I don't recommend it, but you can do that. And so you could just, for example, say the Dreaming Apothecary doesn't exist in your world. But I've allowed my players to use it. They've never abused it. And so let me tell you a little bit about how I run a very wealthy campaign. I've mentioned in other videos how my players and I have been gaming for multiple decades, so we are not new to this game. There's very little to us that surprises us anymore, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about balancing the, the wealth levels. I'm not going to worry about how much gold should you have at this level, this level, this level. And so we basically have a lot of money. They have, they have had tens of thousands of gold pieces at a time. Again, the first worry that I've read about all over the internet, that I've read the articles, that I've seen other videos where people talk about, they're like, oh no, they're just going to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of gold pieces, they're just going to buy plus five armor, plus five weapons, rings of wish, whatever, right? So yeah, that's possible, and again... Right now, my characters, we've been playing since 2017, I've got six characters that are all of 11th level. It's very hard to challenge that powerful of a party, but again, that's our job as the narrators, right? We have to figure out how to balance that. So the first thing that I had to wrap my head around was, A, it's okay that they're super wealthy. B, that with all of these resources, they could potentially just buy the best of the best magic items. And then C, they could have a life of luxury and just blow money like crazy. One awesome aspect of that in Tolis is the city is fantastic at being able to absorb that money. I've read articles about the, the gold piece valuation and how uh, an, an adventuring group can come into a town and just wreck the economy and how that can be super stressful. That will not happen in Tolis because there is billions of gold pieces floating around this city. One kind of cool place is if you come up here into the nobles' quarters, if I can find it while I'm peeking around here, uh, there is a specific restaurant in the Nobles Quarters, and again, I can use my own features over here. Nobles Quarters, come over here. There is a restaurant that you are able to blow a thousand gold pieces. Here it is, the Aristocrats Table. Right here at the Aristocrats Table. Uh, Aristocrats, forgive me. You would be able to blow a thousand gold pieces on one meal at that restaurant. And again, 
if your players want to have all of that wealth, it's fantastic because Tolis can absorb that wealth. So there's no other you know, small town or hamlet your PCs are going to wander through where they could blow a thousand gold on just going to the tavern one night, right? Most people don't even write that down in their character sheets of, hey, I bought lamb stew. But this is a great way that you can do that because as they ratchet up their luxury lifestyle, you can start taking away some of that wealth. Again, back to the idea of they could just buy plus five of everything. Yeah, that's true, but then all you need to do is ratchet up the, the, the stress a little bit, right? Send more monsters after them, send bigger monsters after them, give them better equipment. And again, you can start to mess with the economy a little bit. That Let's say you've got 100 orcs and they all had plus one swords. That's ridiculous, but go with me. If they come into rasters and they want to sell 50 plus one swords, well, he's going to give them 50% for all of them. And if you don't like the idea of them just taking all of that cash right out of the gate, then you could also say, hey, he can only buy 10 of them this month, maybe 10 next month, and so on and so forth. So again, it's in your control, but there's all these levers that you can pull and adjust where you just don't have to worry about it. My players have found this very refreshing, as have I, because they go down, they find all this loot in old campaigns where it was very poor or there weren't big cities that we could go to. It would be really frustrating because you would be lugging around hundreds or thousands of pounds of loot that you can't do anything with, that you couldn't liquidate. That's just not a problem in Tolis. You can get it sold, you can liquidate it, turn it into gems, turn it into even mage coins, which are super cool. They each stand for a hundred gold pieces. You can store them in a vault and then summon them into your hand and give them to somebody and now that it's theirs they can put it away and then you can't summon it again very cool money concept you can also use gems for big purchases and stuff like that another thing that we did was we also used a place that's the, probably this isn't the right way that it should be used but i read one other campaign that they wound up doing uh the same thing but there is a little place called hammersong vaults so it's up here in the Old Town District, Hammersong Vaults right here. You can rent a vault and store stuff there, and essentially it's it's just a bank. It's unlikely that anybody's going to rob it. This says in the entry, nobody has. But one of the strange things that we did was we started using it like an actual bank. What I mean by that is whenever they went into Raster's weapons and they had... 50,000 gold worth of magic weapons that they wanted to offload, instead of us having to figure out, does Raster actually have 50,000 gold pieces behind the counter to give them and then they're going to get robbed on the way out, we had writs, basically. Uh, just a check and deposit where we gave it over to Raster and he said, all right, I'll transfer that money in Hammersong vaults from one place to the other. That's not written in the book, but it was a great hand wave way for us to deal with those massive exchanges of wealth. And again, you can jump up into gems as well, because you can get a 10,000 gold piece gem. That's a lot easier to carry around than actually 10,000 gold pieces. Again, with them having wealth, my players did not decide to just go buy plus five weapons, plus five armor, rings of wish, and just totally break the game. What I've really loved, the book addresses this in a couple of the modules. So there's the Knight of Dissolution module, and then there's also the Bane Warrens module. And in the physical book itself, there's the adventures in the back. Each one of those show properties that your adventurers can buy. And that's something that my party decided to do. This little dot right here on Brandywine Street is actually a, a location from the adventure in the back of the regular Tolis book. They have purchased that lot and they have decided to start building a, a shop and a house of their own right there. Guess what? That eats up a lot of wealth. We have another adventure location up here called the Pythoness House. My characters have purchased this house and... Guess what? They're renovating it. They're making it their own. And I read another online campaign that was really cool where they wound up having dozens of men at arms that they had hired. This is another great way that you can have NPCs, hirelings. Let's say you come up with 10 plus one swords that you need to sell. You hire a butler and then he's the one that takes care of that. So if you don't want to deal with that, if your players don't want to role play through that every time, you can just hand wave it. So again, I'd really challenge you not to be overly concerned about how much wealth they have in balancing that per level, because we play this game to get outside of the reality. Managing money, worrying about money is all something that we have to deal with in the real world, and it's something that myself and my players have really enjoyed in this world. We know our characters are beyond wealthy, 
But the cool thing is there's always a bigger fish. So the nobles, you're probably never going to have as much money as they do. And then you can get into, there's dragons in the city, right? If you look into the nobles' quarters, there is actually the Dalmathun, Dalmathun, if I can pronounce that right. It is called House Dragon. Well, these people are thousands of years old. And, well, I said people, but dragons. They are thousands of years old. And they have got businesses all over the city. Again, that's another area that you can do. I've got one of my players actually has started a business and there's cool rules for that. I'm going to give a shout out to Matt Coville of MCDM. He has a strongholds and followers book that specifically shows you how to run a business and how that can affect the, the area around them. And what I actually have a rogue that is using the uh, information network rules. And it's been really, really interesting. Again, it can be a huge money sink because it costs thousands of gold to get it going and it costs money to keep the the infrastructure going so that's another area that you can use it again dms it's up to you in the end what you allow them to do the city of tolis has nearly infinite possibilities they can wind up buying property they can start businesses they can buy and sell stuff they could even buy a ship and say out into the, sail out into the bay of tolis if they want to right there are floating apartment complexes this is one of my one of my favorite called the soaring ideal which is up in the nobles district up here and so there's this soaring apartment building that floats above the whole area right they could wind up taking up residence in there and it's going to cost them thousands of gold in rent every month i challenge you don't be overly worried about them getting all of the gold and all of the the magic items and everything because your players are in this to have fun too this is a fantasy setting this is a fantasy world we want to live out the fantasy and one of the biggest fantasies is being insanely wealthy so give that a shot see what happens let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts are on a wealthy campaign on managing the resources what you think about having a city that has shops to buy and sell everything imaginable for your players and for you players let me know what you're thinking about that if you're excited, worried about it, etc. When it comes down to the prices, when it comes down to the economy, the narrator has the final say. And if it freaks you out, well, then you can kind of adjust those levers and you decide what's available. You decide what's not. You can make the Dreaming Apothecary not exist. Use it to its fullest extent. Or maybe they're just too busy to get to the, the your players as a customer. So let me know in the comments what your all's thoughts are. Thank you very much. Keep the video ideas coming. I'm really enjoying making these. I've been running a game in this setting since 2017, and it's just a really, really fun setting. So if there's any way that I can help you folks enjoy your time in Tolis and make your running the games and playing the games easier, let me know how I can do that. And check out the website that I'm showing here, which is ptol.us. You do have to prove ownership ownership of the book materials before I'll give you full access to the entire book, but it's completely mobile friendly online. There is a player's guide. So if you want to give that to your players, they can read it on their phones, on their tablets, whatever. You don't have to just have the PDF. Thank you very much, everybody, and have fun gaming.